Chances are that in your Mechanics of Materials course, most of the problems provided an allowable shearing stress or an allowable normal stress. After calculating your stresses for any given structural component, you would make sure that those stresses weren't higher than the allowable stresses. If a factor of safety was one of the questions of the problem, it was most likely defined as the allowable stress over the current stress, either for normal stresses or for shearing stresses. Even though we will cover factors of safety and design factors in much more detail later, this video and the following one will focus on covering the three most common failure theories for brittle materials and ductile materials. Usually, textbooks and lectures present criteria for ductile materials before brittle materials. However, today's video will cover fracture criteria first. Six videos ago, I showed you some stress strain curves for brittle materials and ductile materials. We talked about the elastic section and the difference between engineering and true stresses and strains. And even though that will become more important later, today we will not talk about that. Today we will focus on brittle materials, and for that we need to understand that most brittle materials have a maximum tensile strength that is different to the maximum compressive strength, although there are some exceptions. Usually, the maximum compressive strength is greater than the maximum tensile strength. For example, cast iron can have a maximum tensile strength of 30 ksi and a maximum compressive strength of 110 ksi. For all the fracture criteria, the maximum normal stress, brittle column more, or modified more, we'll use the information that we get from more circle, specifically the principal stresses. If we try to categorize the different cases for the principal stress values for more circle, we would see something like this, where we have two negative principal stresses in case 1, a negative and a positive principal stress in case 2, regardless of if the center is positioned on the positive x-axis or in the negative x-axis, and two positive principal stresses in case 3, where sigma a and sigma b are the two principal stresses and sigma a can be greater than sigma b or vice versa. The first failure criteria states that a component will not fail if neither principal stress is higher than the ultimate strength. The maximum tensile strength is commonly known as the ultimate tensile strength, and the maximum compressive strength is commonly known as the ultimate compressive strength. Therefore, what the maximum normal stress criterion says is that positive principal stresses should not be greater than the ultimate tensile strength, and the absolute value of negative principal stresses should not be greater than the ultimate compressive strength. It also states that the factor of safety can be calculated as the ultimate strength over the maximum principal stress, tensile for positive and compressive for negative, whichever n is the lowest. Since principal stress A is not necessarily greater or lower than principal stress B, stress envelopes are often used for all the failure criteria, where we have the value of sigma A in the x-axis and sigma B in the y-axis. The stress envelope that represents the maximum normal stress failure criterion looks like a shifted square, where the positive values are equal to the ultimate tensile strength and the negative values are equal to minus the ultimate compressive strength. If I assume that sigma b is in fact larger than sigma a, we would find all of our three cases on the top left side of our square, with cases 1, 2, and 3. If we choose to label our principal stresses with sigma a being greater than sigma b, we would find our three cases for more circle on the bottom right of our stress envelope. Now let's take a look at what the maximum normal stress failure criterion is telling us. If both sigma a and sigma b are smaller than the ultimate tensile strength, the component will not fail and the factor of safety would be the ultimate tensile strength over the highest principal strength in this case, sigma a. If both principal stresses are negative, and neither of them are larger than the ultimate compressive strength, the component will not fail, and the factor of safety can be calculated as the ultimate compressive strength over the highest negative compressive stress. Finally, if one of the principal stresses is negative and the other one is positive, we would compare the negative principal stress to the ultimate compressive strength and the positive principal stress to the ultimate tensile strength and the factor of safety would be the lowest of the two. In this case, n1, since SUC seems to be very close to sigma a. The coulomb mohr criterion for brittle materials changes the restrictions for case 2, for when one of the principal stresses is positive and one of the principal stresses is negative. We already know that when we're looking at the principal stresses, the y value, in this case the tau or shearing stresses, are zero. So the only stresses that I'm going to see in my stress element are sigma b, 
and sigma a. Let's suppose for a minute that we're still using cast iron that has an ultimate tensile strength of 30 ksi and my principal stress sigma b is equal to 29 ksi. I know that sigma b is cutting it close, but it's not quite greater than the ultimate strength. So if I follow the first failure criterion, the maximum normal stress, I would conclude that this component is not going to fail. The coulomb more criterion takes into account that other negative principal stress. As I pull in the y direction with 29 ksi, the horizontal dimension of this stress element is going to want to shrink, which will only be exacerbated by sigma a also contributing to it shrinking. It's obviously not about the strain or the horizontal component shrinking, but that horizontal stress is in fact adding up and pushing that element towards failure. If I look at an equivalent Mohr circle for the tensile and compressive ultimate strengths, anything that's not bound by the diagonal lines is assumed to fail. So if my principal stresses yield a positive and a negative value that are close to the ultimate tensile strength and the ultimate compressive strength, but neither of them are surpassing the material property, there's still a chance that my Mohr circle would not be contained by the diagonal lines. This is represented in our stress envelope as a diagonal line in the second and fourth quadrant, the quadrants that correspond to case two of the Mohr circle. If you pay close attention, the factor of safety will still be defined as the ultimate strength over the maximum stress if both of them are positive, or the ultimate compressive strength over the magnitude of the largest negative stress if both of them are negative. In the case where one of them is negative and the other one is positive, we need to do a little math for the equation of a straight line. The slope, which is rise over run, would be SUT over SUC, and the y-intercept would be SUT. If y, which is sigma b, should not be greater than the value given by that straight line, and m is SUT over SUC, x is sigma a, and b is SUT, we can divide by SUT to find that sigma b over SUT minus sigma a over SUC should not be greater than 1. And therefore, the factor of safety can be calculated as 1 over the difference of the fractions. Notice that I did this derivation for the second quadrant where I'm assuming that sigma b is greater than sigma a. If I choose to assume that sigma a is greater than sigma b, I would find the same equation for the factor of safety with sigma a in the first fraction and sigma b in the second fraction. Since what I want to compare to the ultimate tensile strength is the positive principal stress, and what I want to compare to the ultimate compressive strength is the negative principal stress, it doesn't really matter what I label as sigma a and sigma b. Finally, the modified Moore failure criterion is the criterion that comes closer to the experimental results that you get when testing brittle materials. And it's simply a combination of the previous two criteria, where you have SUTs for positive principal stresses, SUCs for negative principal stresses, and the diagonal line goes from minus SUC to minus SUT, where the math is almost identical. In this case, with a different slope of rise over run and a y-intercept that uses that same slope to project to B, where SUT is this distance and the slope times run from here to here would give me the rise from here to here. If I substitute the values and once again I realize that y is sigma b and x is sigma a, I can multiply by suc minus sut, factor an sut from the right hand side, and divide by sut and suc. If I recall that sigma b should not be higher than the value of the line, I find an expression to calculate the factor of safety, where the factor of safety would be equal to 1 over the left hand side of the equation. This expression only holds true for when one principal stress is positive, the other one is negative, and the absolute value of the negative over the positive is higher than 1. The other regions of the stress envelope would remain the same, and the factor of safety would be calculated exactly the same as in the previous two failure criteria. Now if we sum up all of the fracture criteria for brittle materials, in only one sigma a sigma b diagram, we would see the shifted stress for the maximum normal stress criterion, 
a diagonal line connecting minus SUC to SUT in quadrants 2 and 4 for the Coulomb-Moore criterion, and the diagonal line connecting minus SUC and minus SUT for the modified Moore criterion. If you want to check out some simple examples where we make use of these failure criteria and calculate the factor of safety for different cases, make sure to check the link in the description below. Thanks for watching.